to be called selfish, to be considered self-centered. Like it actually cannot be named that. Like I don't want to be associated with the word selfish in any context. Girl, selfish is not a bad word. It is about self-respect. It is about what we want. It is about self-care. It is about self-love, self-fulfillment. <laughs> Welcome to the Self-ish Latina Podcast, where we get to be self-ish together. Okay, are we ready? <laughs> so awesome. All right, so here we go. I recently sat down with Kali Fajardo Anstein, National Book Award finalist and author of Karina and Sabrina here in our studio in Denver, Colorado. In the room during the interview was our summer intern, April Moreland, who I decided to invite as a special guest onto this podcast. And you'll see why once we get started. This whole experience for me has been amazing and also difficult in Mm -hmm. the sense that through this and through like hearing like all the people that we've Skype interviewed or interviewed or talked about or deconstructed all these insanely complex ideas Mm -hmm. for me it's been sort of this healing process Mm -hmm. because you know it's taken me you know until my early 20s to really like accept and kind of dive into my roots Mm -hmm. and it's like everything that we have talked about everything that we've explored on it like every single day like deconstructing these podcasts and talking and thinking critically it's definitely hit me on a deeper level Mm -hmm. because I was adopted and and brought into a Caucasian family Mm -hmm. but it's still you know this experience of like I like my blood is Colombian Mm -hmm. and my lifestyle is not Mm -hmm. and it's like am I Latina Mm -hmm. am I not Latina Mm -hmm. like I want to be Latina but I am not like connected to my Latin roots Mm -hmm. I'm not I don't speak Spanish and I know that that's a lot about you know Kali talks about that a lot like I don't really know that's sort of like my life crises I guess you could say is Mm -hmm. is not knowing how to accept that part of me because I don't feel like I belong in the Latina culture. Mm -hmm. And something that was really, really beneficial and healing for me through this whole internship, realizing that like, I am. I love the way that you describe it and also can hear your journey, like realizing you're not alone and that there's so many different ways to kind of come to your left and bad. Mm-hmm. There's so many different ways to reconcile uh, your feelings about it and that it also is a journey and that we're never cooked. We're never fully done. I got to see Kali at the reading that your mom and you were supposed to be at as well, the one that was sold out. And I didn't really know who she was. My girlfriend told me she was amazing and that I should go. So I show up, hear her share her a part of her amazing book, and I'm like, I've got to interview this woman. Let's make these big, big questions. <laughs> One of the questions that I get over and over that I think is super interesting and I don't understand why being asked this, um, why do you write about women? And that like comes up over and over again and I always think, what, what's like, I'm a woman. Like this is the most natural thing for me to write about. So that has been interesting to think about the fact that if I wrote a book all about men, yeah, I may, I may not get that kind of question. Um, but I usually, I usually answer and say, oh, I come from women, I am a woman. But I, I, I'm starting to wonder if there's certain questions that I don't necessarily need to answer that that well because maybe the person asking should think a little bit more about it. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do, I do think that eventually people will understand that I am writing about men. Mm-hmm. They're just, right. they're not my protagonists. Right. Yeah, and I write about men all the time. This is a book about masculinity as much as it's a book about whiteness, as much as it's a book about being Latino. Mm-hmm. Um, It's just a book about being human. One of the things that was super poignant for me was how much I identified with it, even though I'm a Puerto Rican from New York and she's from Colorado and we have vastly different experiences, but also very similar experiences. What was your impression when you read the book? My mom told me about it and actually we started reading it together. My mom, one night I was just in my bed Mm. relaxing And my mom came in and hopped on my bed and she started reading this book to me aloud. I mean, 
I'm 22 years old. Oh. I haven't read a book with my mom in quite some time. So um, it was really a special experience for me because, I mean, in the book, she talks a lot about, you know, how complex the mother-daughter relationship is. And for me and my mom, reading it together, like, it brought up a lot of emotion because it's like, yes, like, there are times when you can really resent your parent, but at the same time, it's like, you provide me with so much love and opportunity. And it's like, kind of like this, it's a tough thing, especially reading with your mom, but just overall the book for me put a lot into perspective, put a lot of, you know, my experience, her experience, other people's experience into perspective in a very graceful, artful Mm -hmm. way Mm -hmm. that um, even just the kind of the short story aspect of the book I really, really loved because it gives you little snippets and insight into her life. Holly Fajardo and Snoop. Hello, I am so excited to be here and I am deeply honored to be on One World. I'm going to be reading from my story, Tomi, and it's from my forthcoming collection. When my nephew Tomi was a baby, I stole the thousand dollars his mother Natalie kept in her closet. It was for his college fund. She had placed it in a rinsed out mason jar, wrapped in a knockoff Fendi scarf, and hidden beneath a pile of bald socks. I crept hungover and dazed across their carpeted floor, taking that jar and spending everything on liquor and clothes within a week. Natalie always suspected it was me, though my brother Manny said I would never do something like that. Who, he demanded to know, would steal from their own blood. Six years later, I stole a 94 Honda Civic and drove head on into an elderly couple's picture window at four in the morning. An old man wore striped pajamas as he dusted shattered windshield glass from my face. Blood flooded my mouth, a tooth edged down my throat. The old man placed a towel on my lips and told his wife to call an ambulance. When he leaned back through the car door, his pajama arm resting on the steering wheel, he said, look at you, Hita, you're just a baby. I served my time at La Vista Correctional Facility in Pueblo, Colorado. My family didn't call much and they never visited. I marked the days on two calendars, the first filled with illustrations of wildflowers, the second with photos of horses and empty, rustic fields. Toward the end of the horses, my attorney wrote to say that I was up for early release, so long as I got a job and I had a place to live. I planned on moving into a halfway house off Colfax Avenue. When Manny called to say that I could live with him, and told me, won't Natalie, let Natalie be pissed? I asked Manny over the phone. She's gone, he said. She left me. I told him I was sorry, even if I had seen it coming from the beginning. Why are you doing this, I asked him. You're my sister, Cole, my blood. But please, don't fuck up this time. When he was 22 and I was 15, Manny inherited our family home after our father died of a heart attack while shampooing his hair. Our mother was already long dead. When I was very little, she swallowed an entire bottle of painkillers. At La Vista, I read an anatomy book that the heart has no nerve endings. And for a little while, I believed my parents died without any pain. We grew up on Denver's north side in the shadow of Mile High Stadium a neighborhood that was now called Highlands. The only white people said that. Our house was a slender brick square that rested on a high plot, giving it the illusion of something great among knifing condos and black BMWs. I was released from La Vista on an early Tuesday morning in late autumn. Manny met me outside in his white Tacoma that smelled of corn chips and coffee. He wore his canvas Carhartt, his dark hair newly streaked white. Look at you, he said, pinching my cheeks. Someone called Jenny Craig. Yeah, prison don't have no Bud Light. 
Damn shame, I'll get you some chicharrones for the road. He turned up the radio on a Neil Young song and beat out the chorus on the steering wheel. A red rosary dangled snake-like from the rearview mirror. Taped to the dash, Revere de Guadalupe prayer cards, and a Sears baby picture of Tommy. How is he, I asked, brushing the picture with my hand, since Natalie's been gone. I don't know, sad. Manny pinched tobacco into his left cheek. He's failing a class called Read and Relax. You tell me how a person fails to read and relax. We drove by a yellow traffic sign, bullet hold and bent, warning against picking up hitchhikers when near a correctional facility. The sky beyond was larger than I'd ever seen, an oily gray with arrowheads of birds. Impressive, I said. Manny parked the Tacoma outside our home and I pointed to the glass high rise that had appeared where a vacant warehouse once stood. It reflected the clouds, the winged tips of the mountains. That's pretty fancy. Yeah, real fancy, Manny said. It also ruins my view of the stadium. These property taxes are fucking me, but we were here first and I'll be damned before I move to the suburbs. Inside, Tommy was on the living room floor. His hair was a mop of black strands as he clutched a video game controller, swaying right and left, forward and back. His glasses were smudged with spotted fingerprints reflecting the sparkling blue lights of the television. Manny hung his Broncos hat on the rack and unzipped his Carhartt. He had grown softer around his middle, and I wondered if I looked older too. Get up, Manny said. Go say hi to your auntie. Tommy flung forward and video game blood splattered the screen. Hi to your auntie, he said. Hi, Manny walked over, swatting Tommy's head with his right palm. Don't act like such a shithead. She's traveled a long way, son. Thank you. <laughs> so definitely I was called selfish. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the number one thing uh, I was accused of as a child and throughout my adulthood. You are a selfish person. Mm. And I couldn't figure out where that was coming from because I think actually like I'm a communal person that loves and takes care of my family. Mm -hmm. But I set very strict boundaries. Um, and I think that those strict boundaries came from my this obsession that I had to get this piece of work out of. Mm. And if I did not have that obsession, that level of obsession mixed with that selfishness, there's no way this book would exist. Mm -hmm. And so what I've, what I will tell other people that I say, how do you, how did you write a book? You know, that's like one of the big questions. Yeah. Like, how did you do it? Yes. And I, when I say I sat at a computer and I wrote a thousand words a day for years, you know, they're like, oh, that's too much time. I couldn't, you know, I can't actually do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that's how you do it. And they're like, how, but how do you do that when you have, you know, family obligations and you have school obligations mm -hmm. and you have your spouse and your children and all that. So one of the selfish things that I've done is I've created a very minimalistic life for myself. I, you know, I live very frugally. I, I don't have children. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have any of those things because everything was poured into my work. And I felt like once I got that going, I'd be able to focus on those other things. Mm -hmm. But that's the opposite of lo lo what we're told, especially as women. Mm -hmm. um, there were so many times in my life that I was sad or I, I felt like I was a failure because I did not have children yet or I didn't mm -hmm. have a house and I didn't have all those things that you're supposed to have by the time you're 30 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and I realized it was it was just a matter of my independence and my my selfishness. And I'm using the word selfish as independence, I think. Yeah. Um, but I am I'm proud to say that I'm selfish, and I want to be able to pass that on a little bit to other people and say that you are important. Your mind is important. Your your output is important. And if you're not being selfish with your time, that's all going into other people. And that's fine because I came from women who did that their entire lives. Everything mm -hmm. was put out into other people. And some have that calling and some don't, and some want to make you know, the singular piece of work. Um, but it takes an incredible amount of saying no to things mm -hmm. and closing yourself off. And you know, I moved all over the country. I was the first person in my family to leave Colorado. I went to San Diego first, and then I was in South Carolina, and I was in Key West. And 
you know, my family members, especially the elders, were like, why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you out there by yourself? You could be at home with the people where mm-hmm. you belong. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I have to take this job opportunity. Mm-hmm. I've had so many relationships to dissolve because I was like, I have to take this job mm-hmm. right, and teach for a little bit. Or, you know, and they're like, I can't come with you. And I was like, okay, okay I got to keep going. I got to keep moving. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's like, you know, so selfish because it's like the opposite of selfish. It's not because I feel like selfless is too like uh, like that. People give that too much like positive emphasis. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they don't realize there's great cost when you focus on selflessness, you know. And uh, but there's got to be someplace in the middle. And it ha- I feel like it has to do with honoring. And like um, it's incredible how similar our lives are in that way, too. I also was the one that left and I've lived in multiple cities, too. Mm-hmm. And it's like there's like this honoring of this call that you don't know how to even put into words, but that that needs to be honored more than anything. I mean, I didn't have my my daughter until I was 36. So I've Give super... me hope. I can do it. <laughs> You totally can do it. Okay. And I think the honoring of yourself. What will be possible for other Latinos that tr- struggle with their enoughness? Yeah. Um, if they could own their Latinidad mm-hmm. in the same way uh, that yeah. you did yeah. when you set it up. I think, so it was, it's obviously like, I wish I spoke Spanish. Mm-hmm. I wish I spoke my indigenous languages. But I'm, I'm mixed too, so I wish I spoke Tagalog. My great-grandfather was from the Philippines, mm-hmm. you know. Um... I don't really, like, want to know my biological father's German language, but, you know, there were a lot of languages. <laughs> I'm just German. Yeah, but well, I mean, I, I have an I, I, Well, I'm also for Jewish. I do wish I spoke Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> but I, there's just... Um, the, okay, not having Spanish feels like a, it's been a barrier for me to be able to connect across the Latino experience across the world. And it's been something that's been really hard. And I was a terrible student growing up. I, I, you know, I have a GED. I dropped oh, out wow. of high school. Yeah. Wow. So when I would have been studying Spanish, uh-huh. I was like going through deep depression and not even going to school. So uh-huh. there were all these barriers that were keeping me from learning. And so my sisters, some of them have reclaimed the language and things like that. But when I did, had my book launch here in Denver, mm-hmm. I looked out and it was just like this sea of Latino faces and it was a sea of mixed people because that's what we are. We're a mixed group of human beings. Mm-hmm. And one woman raised her hand and like I, you know, I gave my whole spiel and I read from the book and it was really wonderful. And it was a question I did not expect. And now it's a question I get a lot. She's like, what about those of us who are like you, who are between both worlds, who have like a white dad or a brown mom or like what we don't speak Spanish, like what our last name might not even be Latino. And that is a big issue, I think, for a lot of people, because mm-hmm. then you're almost completely erased. And I, I looked at her and I said, I at one point I just learned that I had to love myself the way I was. All I can do is love who I am. And I know what I come from. I come from people who were here for thousands of years who then were colonized by Spanish people and I know what I am I feel it in my food and my stories and the way that my culture interacts with one another and the humor and the gossip everything Mm -hmm. I know what I come from and I have to just celebrate it because Mm -hmm. I can't be ashamed anymore because for so many generations shame was passed down Mm -hmm. to get us to go in the opposite direction to become fully assimilated these people were told like if you abandon all your languages and if you do this you'll be able to get to the stream of Mm -hmm the ideal human being and that's not the ideal human being is just being a whole good person right and so yeah. what about so what if, what's what happens so there's an abandonment right someone decided my dad decided to do it my mom that was one of their biggest arguments was my dad wanted us to speak English, English only. Yeah. And then my mom was like, no, they have to learn Spanish. So she sent my brothers to Puerto Rico every summer to oh, make sure that yeah. they could learn. But I went for two weeks and spent time with my aunt that wanted to practice her English. And so, oh. like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I had to get it in other ways yeah. and whatever, you know. And I still say that my Spanish is, I'm 85% fluent, like, after at least three glasses of wine. Yeah. And I had to be really comfortable with the person. But, um, but so the per so that, like, it's abandoned. At one point, someone decides. Yeah. But that and and they decide for um, survival, yeah. right? And then maybe for uh, this unconscious aspiration to be white, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's the people that have to live with the decision, but who also are part of the narrative um, of the aspiration. Like yeah. so, they don't they don't have it. And then they're also part of the conversation called, well, if you don't have it, then that means that you're more white. Yeah. When they don't feel that, when they feel, and you know, it contributes to. Like, they're kind of playing in that uh, paradigm, whether they like it or not. Yeah. So how did you get out of it? Like, what what was your defining moment? 
I think, <laughs> okay, this is like, a, this is an interesting thing. This is an interesting defining moment. So one of the ways I got out of it was I realized that it wasn't even effing Spanish that we just spoke. Uh -huh. Like there were indigenous languages. Uh -huh. So uh, my mom, you know, she, she, she's been a community activist her whole life and I watched her get shamed over and over again for not speaking Spanish. Oh. And, but I, and so that was like all throughout my life watching her do so much and then also be shamed. And I was like, I can't, I don't want to be a part of this. So I, I think I rejected it really. I went on the totally other side. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing research for my historical novel, that's my follow-up to Sabrina and Karina, which is also part of this compulsion to tell our history mm -hmm. in the region. I was, I knew my great grandmother until I was nine or ten years old, and I knew her sister until I was twenty-five. Mm. Um, my auntie mm -hmm. and my mom was smart enough and brilliant and wonderful enough to make oral history tapes. So I was Whoa. looking through, yeah, and I'm so thankful that I have this. And I was looking through the interview with my great grandmother, and it's so cool because I. The kids are like running around the background of the old Victorian house in Five Points. And she's asking this like very regal, beautiful woman who's clearly a mestiza of, you know, just different ancestry. And she's just so smart and perceptive. And she says, okay, well, let's talk about Spanish. Like, how was Spanish used? Why did you decide not to have grandpa speaking Spanish? And um, my grandmother looks at her and she says, well, we didn't just speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I had like, I got chills. I was like, what? Like, uh -huh. what are you talking about? You didn't just speak Spanish. She's like, we had we had other languages. Uh -huh. And then um, that's when I realized, like, she's talking about Tewa or Tiwa, uh -huh. the, the, the Pueblo languages. Uh -huh. Then she mentioned French. And I was like, what? Uh -huh. And just the erasure of, like, how colonization worked in the Southwest uh -huh. and how Spanish rule worked. Uh -huh. um, and that the fact that, like, that had been completely wiped out of my narrative. Uh -huh. That... Okay, so they were speaking indigenous languages for thousands of years, and then Spanish showed up in the last 300 or 400. I'm like, what? No. Mm -hmm. I want to know about all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think what ended up happening, it was just like an intellectual decision that I made that I may not have it, but I want to know about what happened to us. I want to mm -hmm. know how we lost these languages. Mm -hmm. And then that gave you a sense of, like, a feeling of wholeness? No? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was more like... I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. I can't go back in time and like make the, the I can't raise myself bilingual. Like I can't right. do it. I'm, I'm here on this planet, the way I'm fully formed, how I am. But now I do know I have this power of knowing that we, it was not just one language that a colonizer brought. Yeah. It was multiple things that we lost and we need to widen the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that I can go back and learn all of them right now, but I want to know more about everything. It's mm -hmm. not just one particular language that's going to make my identity. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, of course yeah. it makes all the sense, but it's yeah. interesting. Um, Kali, how are, so I'm super fascinated with how our own community like messes things up for us because there's like I you know because whenever I'm out there on my like what I you know my version of the night that I saw you um <laughs> right like I my feel version of, yeah you know what yeah. I mean like I'm I'm sharing my art right and then mm -hmm. I get the, the very uh certain questions over and over again yeah. and the one that I get a lot is like what do I think about the current administration and and I really like I always think that's fascinating, especially after seeing my film. Like, I think, are you serious? Like, you really are you really questioning like what I think? Although I have strong opinions about it, um, I I'm so much more concerned about how we treat each other yeah. inside the culture yeah. and how how much space we give each other and how much grace we give each other. And I, I think that language um, is a tool that people use inside the culture to yeah. um, to evaluate you know enoughness. And I think that. Uh, conversely, outside the culture, it's used in the opposite way. Yeah. And so, like, inside the culture, you, you don't speak it, well, then you're not enough. Outside the culture, if you speak it, well, then you're in danger of, um, you kind of out yourself, and all of a sudden, you're not one of us, right? Mm -hmm. the out, right? And so and it's always it's always used as a weapon. Yeah. And so I'm just, it's interesting to me that just, like, for you going back and learning about indigenous languages and that there's there's a story before colonization yeah. um, helped you um, kind of reconcile something for yourself. Yeah. So I think for people watching and listening, like um, learning, I guess, the facts. It's always like, bro, we get always messed up in the story. I'm not enough, yeah. right? But oftentimes when we just say, okay, but what are the facts? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm not messed up, right? Because here are the facts. So yeah. that's just an interesting thing. And I love how, I love how, 
you did that. And I think um, even though I feel uh, like a sisterhood with you, I'm, yeah. I'm sure I'm much older than you are. And I'm impressed by um, how young you are to have reconciled that. Aww, yeah. Like you. we like people need to hear that it's possible, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's still like I can't tell you how many times in my whole life people come to me and just start speaking Spanish which mm-hmm. is fine I mean I get it's been my yeah, whole life yeah and it is embarrassing to be mm. you know to say hold on, I'm sorry I don't understand <laughs> or like yeah. I can only follow you I'm not gonna be able to respond mm-hmm. um and it's what's actually has been fascinating is like tons of Chicanos or Mexican Americans mm-hmm. do not come up to me and start speaking to me in Spanish mm-hmm. it's a lot of times It'll be people who are Anglo or white showing me that they speak Spanish. Oh, and wow. Yeah, that's like an interesting thing that happens because I think people who are more clued into the culture. Yeah. Like my, my, my good friend, Eva Lisa Rodriguez. Yeah. Uh, the, she's a Puerto Rican writer. Yeah. She she was like, why would anyone even assume that? Mm-hmm. She was like, you know, she's like, but your, your family's been here for so many generations. So I think it's it is an interesting thing that does happen. And yeah, it's an embarrassment that I... I just, you can't live with shame. You just, it's so hard to keep going forward when you're embarrassed all the time. Yeah. And there's just nothing to do. So at a certain point I was like, I'm sick of being embarrassed. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just going to own that I don't have this. And we need to move on and talk about other things because there's a lot, there's a lot more on the table that I need to be able to talk about if I want to heal um, what's been happening for generations in my family. Yes. And around identity. Snaps to that. Yeah. Like just being sick of like, I mean, honestly, if I had a magic wand and I could cure shame yeah. for our community, yeah. Yeah. oh my God, I would be a saint. You mentioned that you were tired of performing and I so get that. And um, what... What was your defining moment to, like, yeah. stop doing that? <laughs> Excuse me. That's the kind of writer I want to be. I want to be somebody who's nuanced and subtle, and the way that you feel identity is you experience it in a naturalistic way. Mm-hmm. You experience the microaggressions. You experience the racism, the classism. Mm-hmm. Um, but the character doesn't pause and talk to the audience and say, now we're going to talk about racism. Right. You know, I just wanted to show it through scene. I had a long journey to get to where I am as a writer, uh, but there are, there are a couple like defining moments along the ways like along the way where I'm like oh that really that's what pushed me into this trajectory instead of like going down the path I was already going down. So by the time I got to my first MFA program, it was in Southern California. Um, it's important to note that all the faculty was white, and I was I was trying to write work that would be praised in that workshop setting. So even though I was in Southern California, which is a Latino place, Mm -hmm. um, my classes were, again, primarily white. So my classmates are critiquing my work and the professors. Um, And a lot of the work that I had seen that was successful that came out of um, Latino communities was really over the top, like a lot of Spanish and a lot of references to food and a lot of references to identity. And I had, you know, I had that growing up, but I also came from a family that was monolingual because they were ashamed of their Spanish generations back. They were ashamed of their indigenous languages. So we had lost the, the, the language element of it. And then like, you know, we ate Mexican food, but we also ate, we just, you know, that wasn't like constantly being spoken about in our family because it was just normal. Mm -hmm. And I got to a point where I just wanted to write work that felt authentic, like Mm -hmm. my experience, the way that I live my life, not constantly thinking about identity, but having identity um, be part of a holistic experience of who I am, not something that was separate. Um, And so I wrote the story Remedies. That was the first time I ever wrote something that I was like, I'm just going to try to depict us the way that I feel we are, which was a great grandmother who's a matriarch, who's a healer, that's a story um, in Sabrina and Karina Remedies. Mm -hmm. Um, She's also indigenous, she's been in the United States forever, Um, all the generations have been here forever. Uh, There's a loss of language in that story, but there's also folk healing. Mm -hmm. And when I turned it in, Um, Some of the professors liked it, but they asked for more Spanish, Mm -hmm. and they asked for more references to food. And my classmates were like, this is um, totally unrealistic. Why don't these people speak Spanish? (laughs) Why is the great-grandmother, why is the great-grandmother taking care of um, the granddaughter and the great-granddaughter? And, like, just things that, like, to me were normal to have, like, a great-grandparent in my life. They weren't some distant, removed ancestor. Um, And I really... I was like, no, I, I really feel like I don't need to change these things. 
And then the follow-up story that I turned in was just like this blatant, like, this is my identity. It was like a checkbox story. I thought that I was going to get, like, everybody in class was going to freak out, but they loved it. And oh, they gosh. loved it because oh. it was just, here you go, it's easy, it's laid out for you. Right. Um, but Remedies really taught me that's the kind of writer I want to be. I want to be somebody who's nuanced and subtle and the way that you feel identity is you experience it in a naturalistic way. This is, it's crazy. And just so you know, I get really emotional when I talk about this stuff. And whenever yeah. I go like this, it's because I'm calming down my chills. Aww. So um, I realized, wow, like um, the nuance that you talked about mm -hmm. is there. Like even though um, it's so palpable, it's so understood. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I felt what I appreciated about what you created in your story in your stories was just um, like the scene with um, Corina talking about um, the makeup and how she knew, like how exhausting it was for her to um, do the makeup for her 11 like family members yeah. and their friends. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's so like, that's totally me. Like I've done that. I, yeah. <laughs> and like, um, and it's like part of an obligation, but it's also part of the beauty of it is that, is that we come from a collective yeah. mindset, which oh, means I... Right? Like, I, I take care of my family. Yeah. And everyone gets taken yeah. care of. And there's an understanding um, in your writing about that that is fascinating to me because I really mostly only consume nonfiction. Okay. So <laughs> I'm like, and honestly, there's no other book, House on Mango Street, In the Time of the Butterflies, like the authors that we talked about, Esmeralda Santiago, like the books mm -hmm. that they wrote um, really were the last books I ever read that. Um, where I could hear the song that I knew the melody yeah. in the same way I, where I could hear it in your um, stories too. How beautiful that line, you know? the song where I knew the melody. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. I'd love to talk about Sugar Babies yeah, and yeah. Um, Sierra's relationship with her mom. Okay, um, yeah. It really reminded me, um, especially in the scene when, when you were talking about her mom braiding her hair, which is just so intimate and sweet. And when she said, I, I'm still so ashamed um, this is so funny. It's so personal. Yeah. Do other people do this with you too, or no? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's new. <laughs> like, so well, because my work was never out in the world, and now I have it, and I'm like, oh, I felt that way too. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's why I wrote that. Yeah, so yeah. I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. But when she said that she was ashamed that she wanted her mom still close to her, and the yeah. fact that her mom was so in and out of her life, and it really reminded me of well, my relationship with my mom. But also, I hear time and time again, like, the complexity of the relationship between the mother and daughter. Yeah. Um, it's so hard. And especially, um, you know, when you're Latina and you're trying to navigate that, and there's so much expectation, and it's so separate from the mainstream. Yeah. And it just reminded me a lot of, um, of what's really, what's a, a theme that's super important is to just be honest about that like the, about really what's going on and so I really felt for um and empathize with her and I'm curious what inspired you and so you said yeah. it, you, so can you tell me a little bit more about that yeah so I um I'm open about the fact that I had a very complicated relationship with my mother and um it's, a, it's, it's important to note that I come from a family of seven children mm -hmm. um and there's six girls so oh, wow. yeah so like that's a complicated relationship with your mother, and then she's, like, doing that with other, like, all kinds of other women around you. Mm -hmm. um, and that relationship was, it was, it was strange when I was younger, but, um, yeah, I mean, without going into, like, the personal details of it, when I was in my mid-20s, I started to realize that a lot of what I was experiencing through my mother, she had inherited through her own mother. Mm. And I remember there was a point... Um, my grandmother had a stroke and my mom, we were, we were in the hospital room and my mom was trying to help her and um, get situated in her bed. And she came to and the nurses came to help her with something. And uh, she looked at my mother and instead of saying, thank you for coming, Heath, though, or I love you. Thanks so much for being here. She said, oh, you've certainly been eating. It's not like a widely talked about thing that our aunts and moms evaluate us on our beauty. Maybe there are people that either A, don't want to talk about it because they'd be talking bad about their mom, which is totally taboo, right? Um, or their titis. But it's really messed up. The thing that sucks about it is that it's your own family. It's, you know, like 
there's like the external magazine, then like potentially your friends or bullies. But when it's your, it's like when you're sleeping with the enemy, <laughs> that's when it's like the hardest, you know? But it definitely like um, is like a real thing. There's like an immediate evaluation of like how fat or like, oh, you're so skinny, you look so great, you look so beautiful. Um, or wow, like, um, they wouldn't necessarily say it to my face, but I would hear the word gorda pretty quickly, you know? Esa gorda, lolling, oh my God, what's, what's wrong? What's wrong with her, you know? And then it was, how come she can't speak Spanish? And, you know, so it's like right away, right away. And then, um, and then, yeah, if my shirt was too tight or I could never wear a bikini, ever. My other cousin, and we were in our 20s, and she's beautiful, and she wore a bikini, and all of my aunts were looking at her and talking about her, you know? And about, like, just, like, cover up. Like, what are you doing? Like, put this, get out of the pool, you know? You're attracting too much attention. Or looking how, look at how those men are looking at her. Like, male members of my own family, some that were blood related to, right? Like, look at how they're looking at her, like a piece of meat. The meat, it's a very, popular thing for them to say like a piece of meat you know and so when you have when you dress up and like too much cleavage or clothes too tight or pants too tight too much makeup um you're it's too sexy too much you're calling too much attention to you're making yourself a piece of meat or the alternative is you're too fat and so there is there are two different messages there, and it is a way to mess with a young a young woman very successfully, is to evaluate her on her beauty. Like I think if I could have consciously said it, where's the line? Like where's the line so I can walk the so I can walk right there on per, on perfection, right? Like can someone just show me that would that clarity of thought presumes that I understand that this is something that's happening outside of me but when it's happening it feels just like it's true I'm too fat or too sexy so something's wrong I saw a lot of girls just like me their moms were in and out or their moms were doing the best they could with the life that they were given mm -hmm. generations before we even showed up here mm -hmm. before we were even on this planet and I think what happened in my mid-20s and my early 20s is I started mellowed out with my resentment and I accepted that what was happening was it was inherited trauma in some ways that was passed down through legacies and a lot of it came from how we were raised to have men treat us or seeking out certain kinds of relationships. But I think Sierra and her mom in particular, that relationship is, I think it's so intimate, but at the same time it's so fraught because Sierra has like an incredible amount of anger and resentment toward her mother, mm -hmm. but she loves her so deeply. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that all of us, I mean, varying levels of people who've experienced abandonment or parents who just could not love them enough. They know what it feels like to still like look up to your parent as like, you are a god to me. Mm -hmm. You created me. Mm -hmm. I love you. I came from you. Mm -hmm. Please accept me. Please be here for me. And it's just not always possible. Right. And I think a lot of my stories actually touch on like how it's not always possible and in my own life, it created healing for me. Yeah. It made me be, like, I accept, like, you know, like, sometimes even if my mom does something still that, like, upsets me or I know that this is coming from, like, a cultural problem we have, I'm like, it's okay, Mama. I love you. You made me. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So a lot of you may have heard the expression having a seat at the table or trying to get your seat at the table. And this podcast is about creating a whole new table where there's room for amazing accomplished authors like Kali Anstein Fajardo and also upcoming brilliant filmmakers like April Moreland. So um, this was in my experimental filmmaking class for a college course. And um, basically we got like this prompt that just said, we want you to dig deep, dive deep into something personal to you and create a film about it. And it was so open-ended. I was like, I don't know what to, what to do it about. Like, I'm not very comfortable being vulnerable. 
to a lot of people that I don't know. Like I didn't know anybody in our class. Um, so I did a lot of, you know, reflecting and, com and contemplating. And I thought about the things that I'm insecure about. And I really tried to go back to where could all these insecurities come from? And for me, that insecurity is abandonment, mm. not being loved, being left. And just thinking about everything, I concluded that all of those insecurities are rooted from that experience of being adopted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that first experience I had was heartbreak, like being taken away from the mother who carried me in her womb for nine months. Mm -hmm. It's such a profound experience. Even if I don't remember that moment, mm -hmm. I carry that moment with me throughout my entire life. Like mm -hmm. it plays into everything that I do, everything that I think about how I see the world. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to take that and use it to kind of ignite my film that I was making. So the film is called Abandon. And um, I used my own spoken word poetry, which is another outlet that I use to kind of think about things that are hard for me to think about, like my adoption, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I use spoken word. I use film photographs that my older brother, who's very important to me, um, took in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And then um, my own watercolors, which is another form of art that I use to express myself and, and figure out. A worn down blanket cradled my vulnerable body. I was handed off. Will I ever hear your heartbeat? Will I ever feel your kisses? You were so young and with another baby. Is he the only one? Are you the woman with smooth brown hair and chocolate colored eyes that I have imagined you to be? You called me Lucia. Now I am April a woman who loves her life. There's this archival piece of footage of me being brought out and being like placed in her arms for the first time. And I had never seen that piece of footage before mm. until I asked for any footage that she had of my adoption. Whoa. And so I was like watching it for the first time and I was just like, <gasps> like bawling my eyes out. Like, uh -huh. oh my goodness, like this is amazing. Like mom, this is so special. Cause like for me, it looked like, you know, like she like just was like, oh my gosh, like John, my dad, like this is our baby girl. Mm. Like this is ours. And so I honestly think that making the film brought us closer. Like you, it was very difficult for me to make mm. because I was worried that I was gonna hurt my mom's feelings. Everyone has complicated relationships with their mom. Like Kali talks a lot about it, you talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's like this whole other experience with like the mother-daughter relationship mm -hmm. because it's, you know, I come from a whole nother background and culture that she's not familiar with. And so sometimes it's there's a little bit of a disconnection there. Tell me what um, the, what was the result? What did your mom think about your film? Did it hurt her feelings in the way that you thought? She said that she said from an outside perspective, I absolutely love it. It's amazing. I love it. Yeah. But like being your mother, like from the inside, not that it hurts, but it I can't deny that it's hard for me to watch. Yeah. And I totally understand that mm -hmm. and respect it. But I was also like, mom, like just because I'm doing this does not mean that I don't love you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I don't appreciate you or, you know, don't love you unconditionally. It's just that I need to be able to work through my prop, like not my problems, but yeah. things that I've been grappling with that are hard for me. I learned a lot about myself through those 12 weeks of creating the film mm -hmm. in ways that I didn't know were possible. Mm -hmm. um, so this form of art and expression was a huge, huge way that I was able to think about my experience, heal from my experience, and be okay with showing the world and showing 
others and the people that I love how I feel because sometimes it's hard to <laughs> sometimes it's hard to share how you feel about you know really deep things that make you feel vulnerable and uncomfortable so like with what you do here what you know Kali has done what a lot of amazingly strong women have done through art is kind of tell their story in a way that they can feel vulnerable and be okay with it and be proud of it and want to show the world how like their experience how they feel about it and hopefully i hope that my work um like my work was featured on like an adoption blog um so like i was able to experience how my work can help other adoptive children adoptive parents um and i think that that's what you do here is mm. as well you know, be willing to speak your truth even when your voice shakes. And listening to this, I just feel April, I have so much compassion for April and I'm so proud of her in like that big sister way because it couldn't have been easy to sit there with me and have this like intensely um, deep conversation, you know? And, uh, and also to talk about her work, you know, we just flip, we are in and out of really heavy duty conversations here a lot and I feel like we're kind of expert at changing gears and she hung with us she shared from her heart she was articulate she was confident and her voice shook and she did it anyway and to me that's an example right there of courage and I'm super curious like I feel like I must have read that She's been Park was was semi autobiographical. Yeah, most right? of my work is. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I use elements. Yes. Yeah. Actually, this was a story of mine that um, I, when I first wrote it, I gave it to a couple of my mentors, mm -hmm. and it was, the, I felt very vulnerable on the page. I was sharing things that um, were you know violent. They were they were sexually pushing the envelope. There were things that I just I wanted to be able to talk about. And one of my mentors said that that story belonged in the drawer, like never to show anybody. Whoa. Yeah, and I felt like, and I was really like ashamed of her for a while. So I didn't, I didn't show it. And I didn't show it for a couple years, and then I worked on it again. Um, but yeah, I think you know, in my bustle interview, I was very, um, I was open about the fact that there, when. Um, when Monica, so there's Monica and Liz, yeah. are the two twinning characters, and I work with twinning characters a lot. Mm. Um, when Liz reports the assault and she goes to the police state, or when the detective calls her, he hits on her. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that, you know, something that happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that is, and I wanted to talk about it because I think there's so much, um, there's so much about like report violence, make sure you're, you're always doing the right thing. And I had grown up witnessing domestic violence. Mm. Um, from my biological father toward my mother and I always told myself even as a little girl if anyone ever hits me I'm calling the police I'm doing the right thing mm. I'm not going to keep going back I'm not going to be in this relationship where I'm worried that I might die mm. and the time that I did I, I got hit on mm -hmm. and I was encouraged don't don't press charges you don't want a trial you don't want this to take a long time you just want to get out of here mm -hmm. and I think it I felt like it was important that I actually talked about that because I think that women need to be prepared that it doesn't it doesn't just go away when you report it. Mm -hmm. You're you're facing a whole new set of obstacles. And Liz, I think, is a really interesting, resilient, strong character, and especially like living with her mother who's been a victim of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And when you run them up against a character like Monica, I think it's just, it's, um, that, that story though is I think one of my darkest. Mm. And it's sort of fascinating because people think that Sisters is very dark. And I, you know, yeah. Sisters is an incredibly dark mm -hmm. story, but mm -hmm. I think Cheeseman Park at the center of it, it's talking about a lot of ugly truths that we don't want to discuss or look mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. what, like what? I think, th I have no idea how many women are experiencing domestic violence, but I know that I, growing up, that was like my entire world. I mean, that's what it felt like. When you feel unsafe, when you're witnessing violence, mm -hmm. um, that permeates your entire existence. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many women are out there going through that, but I think it's a lot more than talked about. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, that's one of the main things that I wanted to discuss in Cheeseman Park. And also the relationships between women mm -hmm. and how women are able to come together and support each other. And sometimes even those relationships are super toxic. Mm -hmm. And Monica, as you know, she's a fascinating, fun character, but she's got some shit she's working out. She's yep. a very toxic person and she's passing that on to everybody else around her. Um, but with all my characters, I hope that the reader does not dislike her. Mm -hmm. I hope that the reader cares about her, even though she's making these poor decisions. So, yeah, I think it's a lot about, you know, a character who, I, you know, has absorbed their own kind of pain and making the decision to either pass that pain on to other people or doing the work of healing the pain and getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it ever goes away, but being able to manage your own pain before you hurt other people. Yeah, and I think I think people don't realize that consciously you yeah. know like in the mother daughter and I love that moment when Liz was like no take me home like she might be worried about me and Monica was like she's asleep in her own room like what are you worried about but there was like this uh, respect which is also a very collective thing like just mm -hmm. the idea if she wakes up for a moment like goes to the bathroom I don't want her to worry you mm -hmm. know there's so much love and trust in that relationship and I don't think her mom wants to pass that down to Liz the tolerance of domestic violence but I think when there's that opening of trust and like love and then modeling it's a, a recipe for I'm going to probably be in this situation too yeah don't you think and and then like like, how will the character know, or how will people in real life know, when is it time to handle that pain? I think that as soon as you recognize that you have that pain, it's time to handle it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, I am not kidding when I say, like, writing Sabrina and Karina saved me. Oh. Like, I don't, like, the amount of self-destructive qualities that I had in my early 20s and my late teens, mm -hmm. you know, suicidal thoughts, binge drinking, abusive relationships, drug use, all those things. And I'm open about it and I talk about it because if I had not written this book, mm -hmm. I would have kept going into that as much as possible until it destroyed me. Mm -hmm. And I believe me, I saw a lot of girls that I grew up with and a lot of women in my life who, who were destroyed because of their the pain that they could not manage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as soon as you recognize that you have tendencies that you have behaviors that are outside of your control and you have patterns, mm -hmm. I think it's a good time to start reflecting on them and start noticing them. And, you know, that doesn't mean, like, jump head on and be like, I'm cutting everything off cold turkey that hurts me. Sure. I think it means just, like, paying attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, there were times in my life when I would go and I'd get blackout drunk, and I started to realize it was when I was feeling lonely, mm -hmm. like when I wanted to be hugged. Mm -hmm. Not even, like, going seeking sexual relationships, but I just I wanted somebody there to say that they loved me or cared about me or missed me. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start realizing, oh, maybe when I'm feeling those urges, go spend time with a girlfriend of mine. You know, go to the mall. You don't need to go get blackout drunk. <laughs> you know, go do something with your sisters. Or, and just being open and vulnerable to saying you need help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've realized that it's been, it's been hard to, to ask for help. That's one of the biggest issues of my life. Mm -hmm. So when you start recognizing that pain in yourself, I think also building yourself up to be able to ask for help the way that you need it. In, from whomever you need it from. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna throw yeah. something out at you yeah. about this, because <laughs> I run a coaching group for Latinas specifically to empower them to follow their dream. I'm super committed that everyone gets the opportunity that you and I have yeah. to just pursue our, the reason why we're here. Like, we're both clear, we know why we're here, and we're pursuing it voraciously, and we've designed a life around it. Yeah. And I think that the more pain that someone's been through, the better suited in a way they are because yeah. like they have an incredible well. Asking for help is is the homework in one, it's a seven week program mm. in one of the weeks and they turn in their homework, right? And uh, they just put it on the, our private Facebook group. And everyone said, I didn't, I didn't ask for help because the homework is, I, I want to create a lot of tension. So the homework is ask 10 people for help. Oh, and okay. you can ask me for help. Like I try to make it easy, but just ask for it and be mindful that you're asking for it. I'm going to tell you, like, everyone, no one did it. Yeah. And they all said, yeah, I didn't do it. And the thing is, they don't realize that it's a very cultural thing. Asking for help is we don't ask for help. Latinos yeah. don't ask for help. We have to stay in the collective. Like, and so if, I, if, if someone outside of us knows your pain, then we are responsible for your pain. We have yeah. to deal with that, right? Here's another layer, though, and this is what I want to, and I, I would love to get your feedback on all of this stuff, but I believe our ability to receive, our ability to believe we are worthy is very much, our worthiness is very much correlated to our ability to ask for help. Interesting. And if, it's fascinating. 
thank you. Yeah, I'm like, whoa. Thank you. Because yesterday yeah. I was like, this is brilliant. Yeah. Like, I could do, right? And so it's yeah. like, we can't ask for help because we don't think we're worthy of it. And until, and so we have to exercise the muscle of asking. No, I think, so when you're talking, I was thinking about so much of what I've gone through in my own family and the, the big community is like, don't tell anybody. Don't ask for help. We don't need help. Uh, don't call the police on that relative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then when the police show up, don't say anything happened, if the police ever show up. So um, it's, it's like funny, but it's actually not funny. Um, and I do think, I think it comes from maybe a couple of things. I think it comes from monitoring who's in control and who has power of a group and things like that. And also protection and not knowing if you can ask for help because if you ask for help, you're opening yourself up to being more vulnerable and you're allowing more people into your life. Um, so I, I do think it's that that is in place for reasons that are that are probably pretty troubling and sad. Mm-hmm. Are you um, talking about like um, people in control, like white, like are you talking yeah, about that? I'm t- yeah, I'm talking about like, so... What about when that happens in Puerto Rico? Yeah. And it's not about uh, skin color, let's say. Yeah. Well, I don't, I've don't. i never been to Puerto Rico. Or what about if it happens <laughs> in any of the homeland yeah. countries? Because it's derived from, this is a collective mindset that's a, it's part of collective mindset in general. Yeah. Right? And so it's, I mean, I'm not saying that certain groups don't derive power from it and they didn't yeah. hitch their wagon to it and they're not like, oh, here's a way we can mess with them. Or if they're doing it consciously or unconsciously. My assertion is, though, it mm-hmm. existed before that. Yeah. Well, I think. Well, I, I do think it's about power within the family or community unit, and I think a lot of the times, um, that power is going to fall on. I mean, I come from a family where I had to like serve men plates as a child. Like mm-hmm. it, the men are the powerful ones, even though the women are controlling everything and running the families. Mm-hmm. So I do think it comes from. Again, I think it's just power dynamics and who's allowed to tell a story. Um, but the, the idea of asking for help. Um, so I, I did not come from a people who went to therapy. I did not come from people who sought help. And in fact, if you admitted that you had um, any sort of mental illness going on, that was considered a weakness and it also was considered probably fictional. Um, mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with you. Mm-hmm. This is just the way that people have always been. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of stigma attached to receiving help and the kinds of help that are acceptable to receive. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think a lot of what I experienced in my life is when I would go ask for help, mm-hmm. I would I would go to the wrong um, providers. So I'd, you know I'd go to a school counselor and say, I need help. I'm failing everything, and I just, I want to go to a four year college. And that's what led me to dropping out of high school because they said there's no help we can give you. Whoa. Yeah, because you have such a low GPA, you won't be able to get into a four-year institution. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there was other things going on. So I think also you're dealing with people who may have tried a couple times and it it wasn't somebody who was equipped to help them. And Mm -hmm. then you give up right away. Um, and then what was the third? There was a third component. Yeah, the, um, the, the not asking because there's a lack of belief of worthiness. Yeah. Totally subconscious. Yeah, and so actually the, the, something really just happened recently where like I've been on tour straight almost since March. Um, you know, I put myself on tour. I'm funding it. I'm organizing it. I'm doing all the reaching out. And I've been told, like, you don't have to do that. Of course, like, I want to do that, though, because I want to build an audience and I want to meet people and I want to make sure that my book is getting out there and reaching the people I wrote it for. Um, but there there came a time recently when I had no feedback, right? I, the publisher didn't tell me if I was doing a good job or not. Um, everything was just like, you know, I'm checking with my agent and my editor and we're just talking about like doing interviews, promotion, more, more, more. And at a certain point I wrote both my agent and my editor who are young women who are my age. And I said, I'm just going to admit to you both that I'm incredibly stressed out. And I didn't even ask for help. I think I was just sending like the signal flare. Like, yes, there's something going on. Like, I need you guys to talk to me. Um, as soon as, you know, the, the next work day came around, they called me right away, both of them separately. <laughs> yeah. And what's so fascinating about it, before I would take any sort of praise or congratulations, I had to hear from them that they saw how much work I had done to be able to accept help. Whoa. I needed to hear from them that they saw that I was worthy of even having my book in the world. Mm-hmm. And when I got off the phone, I was like, did I really just need to hear that I've, I'm a good person? That I'm, Why do I need that value to come from outside of me? 
And that is, that's something I need to start working on unpacking because mm -hmm. it's now it's something I'm recognizing about mm -hmm. myself and I'm like, oh, this, this needs to be worked on. Yeah. So yeah. this is exactly what our call was about yesterday. Like literally. Yeah. Now what, what did that look like? How did that play out? Like, so you are on the phone with them. What did you say? I you just, interpreted like, like that. I was just like, I need you to tell me that you see mm -hmm. the, like, you see all the work I've done. I need you to tell me that this is good. This is positive. I'm a good person. I need to hear that I'm valuable. Yeah. And at one point I said, it's like having a boss who never tells you that you do a good job. And then we, we all, I, like, I paused and I was like, wait a second. Do we all come from this? Mm -hmm. Do we all come from like, it's not just work relationships, it's family relationships, it's romantic relationships and like, just being able to hand out praise and help without, you know, without thinking that there are strings attached to it. Mm -hmm. And I, in in going back to Sabrina and Karina in Any Further West, um, there's a line that gra the grandmother says, there are strings attached to cash. Mm -hmm. When, you know, this old cowboy helps, the, helps Desiree get out of their little town and move to California. Mm -hmm. There's always a warning. Like, if you're going to get help from somebody, you better be careful because they're going to have power over you. Yeah. And whether or not that's even true. You know? Yes, but that's where she's coming from. So yeah. yesterday I was talking about the three types of, the call yesterday was called giving and receiving. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's three, there's three ways of being. There's the, um, the taker that takes. And the thing is, I think takers have a bad rap. Because the takers, um, I was a taker after my brother was killed in a drunk driving accident and my, my father had passed away just a few years before. Mm -hmm. And I was a taker during the time I was in college because I, I felt like I was fucking empty, yeah. you know? And I remember this weird thing, like I went to my boyfriend's friend's house and I, it's like a weird memory that I have and I'm like, why, why did I do this, right? Mm -hmm. But now, I, you know, with the looking back, I understand. He had like this monster size bottle of Advil. And I went to his bathroom and I saw it and I was like, Advil, oh my, like, and I was, whatever, I guess I took Advil a lot and I felt like I needed it. It's almost like taking, it's, it's almost like um, people that take uh, like a big to-go plate from the a la carte like, yeah. buffet, yeah. you know what I mean? I, I took a bunch, I, I, I filled my like pocket with, like I probably took 50 of them. Oh wow. And I left and I showed my, my then boyfriend, he's like, why did you do that? And I'm like, why did I do that? And I remember feeling a weird shame, like why, because it was like stealing, right? But yeah. really I was taking anywhere that I felt like there was more, aye, yeah. aye, aye. anywhere that I felt like there was more than enough. Uh huh. I took, if I had access, wow. I took the balance. <laughs> That's interesting. That yeah. is fascinating. Right? Yeah. And so I don't, I don't, um, I don't, want to vilify takers like you know like, yeah you're a taker you're i want to be a giver like that's the the good person yeah. in the conversation right um but the taker really is so needy of like that love of the hug of the yeah right? like they just need to be filled up like it's like the taker needs to be given like like have their like ra arms wrapped you know around them and, and given the love that they feel like that ache was huge yeah that, right and then there's uh the giver the opposite that can be a martyr that can be like oh like um they don't ever get what they need until they're on the floor like i've done so much like, you know yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. typical yeah. latina mother yeah. like nobody appreciates yeah. me <laughs> and then everybody's yeah. like trying to like oh what do you need oh wait but that comment of when she said that i was like oh my gosh it's so she's a matcher yeah because matchers feel like there's always strings attached interesting and there there's always a cost and they can't just receive yeah because there's been some some line at one point something happened when they realized I have to pay for this yeah right and yeah. so a matcher shouldn't be vilified either but what I'm curious about is a story like what happened with the grandmother that she um, had to make that decision and then she passes it on like these things are not passed on like oh I'm gonna pass on this thing and it's like and you're gonna be burdened with it for the rest of your life and it's just like I'm gonna give you these glasses I'm gonna give you this bad vision it's so insidious it's, yeah. it's more like I'm a matcher and I'm gonna teach you through these things I say and do that the world always wants something from you if you take from it. Yeah, that's right? fascinating. I think, well, now that you say that, I think I've been around, I think those that I looked up to were matchers. Mm. Because I think the the takers and the givers, they were too chaotic. But the matchers are the ones that seem stable, even though they're not. Mm -hmm. But what, as you're talking, I thought of my story, Tommy. Mm. And, you know, Tommy's literally stealing pillows. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And he's really trying to fill up that void. So he's, he's taking and taking. And then... Um, 
Cole in that story, who's who's been recently released from prison, she's committed all these crimes throughout her life. Um, she's trying for the first time to be a giver. Oh, and that's yeah. one story I didn't yeah. read. Yeah. Oh no, but really he, so she's trying for the first time to give to her little um, nephew, uh-huh. and it's just it's just a story of like how you know somebody is trying to reform themselves and be a different kind of person, but then they're still viewed as what they always were, which was somebody who was a taker. Mm. And so you can move out of those roles, I think, but it's hard to convince the people around you that you're done with your old role. Yes. Yeah, that I'm now I'm going to be somebody because my you know I'm sure you can imagine I was quite the taker. <laughs> Uh-huh. When you're not healed, you're not able to give. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think about, like, with my book, um, Being Out in the World Now, I always, one of the metaphors that comes to mind a lot is, you know, I'll try to help people with their careers, too, but I'm like, I'm trying to help myself right now in this mm-hmm. period of time. Mm-hmm. And I think about being on the airplane when they drop the, you know, they say they're going to drop the oxygen mask. Like, yes. just yours before you adjust yes. everybody else's. Yes. So I always think about, like, is your mask adjusted? Mm-hmm. Are you able to breathe? Okay, now you can help the people around you. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we don't want no lopsided mask hanging off our face. Like, right. trying to help people. And your work is really important. And the fact that you're... Uh, self-financing your tour and it just shows like your commitment to the impact because obviously you've seen it and like I started crying a few times when we talked because it was so impactful for me and it's transformative it's important so your uh, your oxygen mask cannot move (laughs) thank you you. I'm trying I'm trying Um, but again like that's so like you telling me that that's like that takes the place of like me like I need the feedback I need the value Mm -hmm. and I guess the best way that I've been getting it is just seeing how especially young women are connecting to this book um, people from diverse backgrounds I even had a middle aged white man in Minnesota after I talked about abandonment come up to my signing table and say he went through the exact same thing I did Whoa. And I was like, how is that possible? You know, like, I was yes. like, how is it possible you went through what I did? But yes. then I was like, it doesn't matter. He's feeling, he's channeling his pain. He feels a connection to my pain. And it does, I think I'm learning that the reward is really just coming from the people and the readers and the mm-hmm. feedback that way. Um, and it is, it's really exciting, especially because I was working on this book by myself for 10 years, getting a little story published here or there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, I didn't know it was going to make any sort of impact. Mm -hmm. And now to see the impact that it's made, I'm like, there's a lot of us. We have a lot of sadness to talk about. I mean, it's remarkable. I mean, because I feel like there are a lot of people kind of that maybe started 10 years ago, maybe longer, right? And they just couldn't, they didn't have the gas enough to um, see it through. And I think who you are, who you can be, for anyone listening or watching is it's worth it to see it through. And it's almost better that you didn't know if anyone would resonate. Cause you did like the expression for expression's sake, the reward is guess what? Like, yeah, the universe, the collective themes. That's why the white dude in Minnesota, was it Minnesota? Yeah. yeah like yeah. that's why he gets to come too. Yeah. Because you just spoke from your heart. And then I get to go because I'm <laughs> super close, you know, yeah. to the narrative, but then also a far away. And I get to see like, wow, this, you know, far away because New York, Puerto Rican, you know, um, mm-hmm. and then, you know, the border crossed us, but then I get to see how the themes are so intertwined. Yeah. Like it never stops. The commonalities never stop, you know? Yeah. Um, and so the thing um, that I wanted to share with you that was was the ending of the call yesterday, and the thing also that I too have to practice, just so you know, mm-hmm. it's very uh, normal, and uh, it's like that, that thing that proving, you know, like, um, which is also I heard, because I've always been a prover, and um, this author, T. Harvecker, said, like, he's like, I've been a prover, too. It's not a bad thing. Like, that's why I've always wanted to prove, you know, basically, my book is telling the world to fuck off. And, like, he was just, and now he's, like, a, like a multimillionaire. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, good. So, yay for the provers, right? And uh, two separate things, or multiple things have happened in the project. One, we were invited to the Obama White House oh, wow. to screen the film, but it didn't work out. And it's mm-hmm. going to be in the film. Great disappointment. And I really use that external thing. I was Mm -hmm. like, oh my God, now I'm going to be like worth it. Like now I can, you know, use that like as street cred and, uh, and mostly can earn the love and, and, uh, like to earn my mother's love. Like this will fucking seal a deal, Yeah, you know? And then it didn't work out. And then there was a program at Harvard that I was invited to participate in that I eventually decided not to, but that was solely because I thought after I graduated that I would have earned that 
worthiness. Yeah. And it was the moment where I, I realized that I didn't even I didn't realize that I was doing it until I did. And then I'm like, shit, I can't go. But then it, what it sacrificed is I still have that ache of needing that yeah. of needing to feel like I've got to do more or accomplish more or help more. Um, I can't just freaking have what I want to what I'm already giving to my kids, which is, you know, being able to tell them, which is such a cool thing mm -hmm. that they don't have to earn anything with me. Oh, wow. And that I, I have a thing with them where I say, why does mommy love you? <laughs> and um, and they're like, because I was a good girl today, like when they were young, right? Mm -hmm. These girls right here. And uh, and they slowly learned that the answer is, is because I'm me. Mm -hmm. And I also say like, what did you what did you do to make mommy love you so much today? It's a trick question. Yeah. And they're like, um, nothing. And I, you know, because yeah. they know the answer. And then I'm like, well, does mommy's love change for you? And the answer is yes. And mm. and the, and they know the next thing is it only grows. Aww. And um, and so that's it can only go in one direction. Aww. And I'm like, but why? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, because of me. And I'm like, yes, you don't have to earn anything. Like everything you want is yours because you're you. Yeah. And mommy's love is always growing, not because of anything that you do or don't do. And I just want you to like hear that too, Aww. because I feel Thank like a you. lot of us like need to hear it. Like. The earning is in your own existence, right? Thank you. <laughs> and like, <laughs> yeah. and like your creative expression, you sitting down and believing yourself for ten years, and like, whatever you had to do to reconcile. I don't know, but I know it's a lot. Just, I call it the skinny branches of life. Like, I tell the women, listen, mm -hmm. all of us at the skinny branches. Like, there's not a lot of assholes on the skinny branches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we've all had to like. Reck it. We've all had had a reckoning multiple yeah. times, and we've all had to meet our maker multiple times and confront these things. Really, not outside of ourselves, but all yeah. within. It's all the worthiness stuff, you know. Yeah. And um, anyway, yeah. I just appreciate your um, whatever it took for you to keep going. Thank you. I needed to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I really, you know, as you're talking, I was like, well, I mean, because there is like that. It's that void. It's like. When I was, like, when I was talking to my editor and agent and saying, like, I need this feedback, I need you to tell me I did, did a good job, at one point I said, I don't want to feel like I'm letting my people down. Mm. And, like, that's absurd. Where did, where the mm -hmm. hell did that one come mm -hmm. from? That, like, now I have to, like, carry everybody. Right. And, like, it's a lot of it is just, it's self-imposed. But I, I do think about it. I'm like, what would make me feel... Like I've, I'm valuable. Would it be a New York Times bestselling book? Would it be winning the National Book Award? Mm -hmm. What would it be? And I think it is like there's just some way. Like I have to start figuring out. And everybody has to figure out that our value has to come from intrinsically who we are. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard because the messages for so long have been you earn your love. Yeah, and then yeah. because we're from a marginalized community, there is a pressure, yeah. um, and it's it's also an honor, right? But it's also a pressure to bring everybody with you. And yeah. so I think that the what we need to realize as leaders in our community um, is that our art is our like that f that fulfills on it yeah you know Be that's what um, that's what we're giving that's mm -hmm. our contribution yeah. because the conversations that I get to have now like my friend Carrie I hadn't read the book when I was sitting there. But mm -hmm. my friend Carrie was telling me about you for months. And, um, and I'm like, God, I can't wait for Carrie to get back because I want to ask her what she thought of this character and what she thought of that character and this story. Like, why, like, just so curious now to talk to other readers of the story is to understand what, how they understood these narratives and that enriches my relationships. Oh, And that's just that's you so being cool. creative, yeah, right? That's so cool. So, like, yeah. there's nothing to do. And the <laughs> activists will be activists and they'll go march on Washington and the artists will create art and they'll move lives and they'll change things by affecting the narrative, A, yeah. and by inspiring the conversations that happen after. So, uh, like, that's what it is, in my opinion, right? So, like, but from someone who also feels like, gosh, I feel like I should be doing more. Um, and then I realized, no, the more has been done. Oh. And all I have to keep doing is 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 meeting amazing people like you and having you share your story so people know that they're not alone, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that was so cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oh, you made me feel so good. Of course. I, I didn't know today was going to be a feel good day. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> now, if you're on Instagram, please take a snapshot of your phone right now. Tag Project Enya and let us know how much you loved this episode. 
This podcast is brought to you by the Enya Dream Accelerator, our monthly membership for ambitious Latinas who want to make your dream life your real life without feeling guilty for putting yourself first. Thanks so much for joining me on the Self-ish Latina podcast where we get to be self-ish together.